Hello and welcome to the session. Now our title today is Verses, Analysing Poetry. I'm Mr Craven, Senior Director of English for NET, and today we're going to be engaging with the delights of poetry. The session is very much intended to offer a clear introduction to studying poetry, including how we deal with issues such as form, perspective and analysis, along with some tips about how to approach the teaching of poetry. Now, hopefully by the end of the session you'll feel that we've been able to explore what poetry is, how to read a poem, ways to analyse and unpack a poem, and how it can make poetry less scary for students. This will also set up what comes next in the programme, which is Ashley Pott's excellent session on how to work with poetry. Now the verses bit in the title of today's session is obviously rather a cheap pun, I'll admit, but there's a serious point there as well. Students often feel something of an antagonistic relationship with poetry, as if it's out to get them, as if it's something they have to beat into submission. In actual fact, I'd argue that the opposite is in fact the case. Poetry can be and should be something accessible for all our students, as long as they're equipped with the skills and the confidence to do so. So what is a poem? It sounds like a very easy question, so let's have at it. What is a poem? Now, for those of you who have studied aesthetics as part of a philosophy course, you'll spot the same warning indicators flashing as that horrible question of trying to define art. So poetry is... Now, for those of you from the same generation as me, you may remember the best words anthologies taught at GCSE, based on the idea that poetry is the best words in the best places. It's a lovely definition, not just the words, but how we arrange and how we organise them. Though if we're brutal and blunt, it doesn't really tell us a great deal. After all, couldn't that equally define any text? Does this make graffiti poetry? Is a poster really just a poem in visual form? Was that wordle on my son's birthday card the work of a poet? Could my shopping list really be a poem in all but name and frame? Well, for safety's sake, let's turn to our old friend, the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED, in which that defines a poem as a literary work in which the expression of feelings and ideas is given intensity by the use of distinctive style and rhythm. There, all cleared up. Of course, it doesn't tell us what that distinctive style is, and there's no requirement for a poem to have a rhythm. Poems do often have a stylistic difference from prose or drama, but some novelists write in a very poetic style, and some poets are careful to avoid anything self-consciously poetic. The feelings and ideas bit seems safe enough, though, again, not saying a great deal. Now, Cambridge's definition is similarly a bit limited. For them, a poem is a piece of writing in which the words are arranged in separate lines, often ending in rhyme, and are chosen for their sound and for the images and ideas they suggest. Lines, possibly rhyme, words chosen for effect. Better, but it's still very nebulous. And as with the OED definition, it could more or less apply to any and all texts of any genre. And that's before we even go near the idea of prose poetry, which is, yes, a thing. What about other definitions? Well, a few pop up if we Google it. The spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Too emotional. And the spontaneous bit is wrong far more often than is right. The language of the imagination and the passions similarly applies to any creative writing, potentially. And as with the spontaneous reference in the previous definition, it, it misses the fact that poetry is refined, shaped, polished. It's almost never just a messy splurging of emotion on a page. A kind of ingenious nonsense. Unhelpful. Although I'm sure any poet would happily take the ingenious bit. Painting with a gift of language it isn't bad, actually, that one. Artistic linguistic. Basically anything that calls itself a poem sounds rather judgmental, but is probably true, though we could debate about who gets to decide whether something is a poem or not. Language at its most distilled and most powerful is also somewhere in the right ballpark, though again I'm sure novelists, advertisers, journalists and playwrights would also lay claim to that. Because the problem is that poetry is hard to define, just like art. It uses words, it's in a text, it may rhyme, but it doesn't have to. It may be in regular lines, but it doesn't have to be. It may be in verses, stanzas, but it doesn't have to be. It may deal with emotions, but it doesn't have to. It may focus on ideas, but it doesn't have to. It may be expressive and personal, but it doesn't have to be. 
It may be rich in sensory detail, but it doesn't have to be. The problem is we know poetry when we see it, but it's very difficult to pin it down in a clear and unambiguous way. Michael Rosen, in his excellent book, What is Poetry?, concludes that a poem is a poem if the writer and the reader agree that it's a poem. Now, for me personally, painting with language is probably closest to how I see poetry as a genre. And that links with the idea of it being language at its most distilled and powerful. After all, what makes a poem a poem is the refinement of the language, the way that the words work in any and all dimensions. It's writing with the gloves off, where the poet makes or breaks whatever rules they want to in order to achieve their intended and desired effect. Poetry done well is like a diamond, ideas, emotions and impressions pressured into perfection, cut into the perfect shape and polished and refined until those words shine. To cut the waffle for a moment, there are, of course, trends we can identify. Poems are usually in stanzas. They usually explore emotions or ideas. They usually rely on imagery and sensory details. They usually use their formal shape to layer up the depth of meaning. They usually aim to convey some deeper message or idea. They often rhyme, especially historically. They're often deeply personal and even autobiographical. And if a text fits logically into any of the Venn diagramming overlaps in those trends and tendencies, it's probably a poem. As a teaching point, it can be very interesting to ask students to define what a poem is, to interrogate their definitions, and then to watch the familiar become unfamiliar and realisation dawn. So why do people see poems as challenging? And let's be honest, people do see poems as challenging. The problem with the poem is that people see them as like a maze or a puzzle, something complex and complicated and with tricks and traps and stings in the tail. Poems are often seen as very intellectual, as very refined, and therefore as taking a lot of thought and effort to understand, along with the risk of getting it wrong or being seen as stupid. For a lot of people, it's a bit like taking part in a pub quiz written by someone who's really good at quizzes and wants everyone to know it. Now, some poems can be like this. If you head back to 18th century satirical poem, poems, it can be great fun. They can be wonderful, but each of them can also be dense enough in terms of the language, the referencing and the sheer intellectual depth of them as to be impenetrable. It's sorry, impenetrable, impen impenetrable, that was what I was reaching for. And there's an example on the, uh, on the screen there, The Rape of the Lock. In terms of more modern, and particularly modernist poetry, if you come across some of T.S. Eliot's work, with The Wasteland being probably the best known, there's extraordinary, extraordinary work there. But there's not many who would claim to fully understand every aspect of it, and those who do are often guilty of hubris. And again, there's an extract from it on the screen there. Now, if you look at that on the page, I imagine being a student faced with that, with either of these two. Now, most poetry, thankfully, isn't like that. And a really important point to engage with here, as with Michael Rosen's comment, is the importance of the reader. A poem can be like a breadcrumb trail by the poet, leading us to an idea, an image, an emotional experience, a realisation. But the poet doesn't have a monopoly on the meaning. As readers of a poem, our students are on a voyage of discovery. And as long as they and we engage carefully and rationally, then whatever we take from it, wherever we arrive, the destination that we reach, is valid. So again, why do people see poems as challenging? Now the perceived self-consciousness of poetry can also be a barrier to engaging with it. We'll probably all know someone at some point who in our lives has decided that they are a poet with a capital A and a capital P. And every year there are students who bring their poems to me to read. And there's some wonderful, imaginative, creative, expressive stuff out there. And it can be an absolute joy to share. However, sometimes people leap for what they imagine to be the romantic ideal with a capital R, the floaty shirted, otherworldly, semi-mystical artist whose feelings and thoughts are more profound than the mere mortals around them. And they miss the fact that simply disgorging onto the page with some funny line breaks, some odd word choices, and some convoluted grammar doesn't necessarily create a meaningful poem. And that complexity and profundity are not the same thing. It's also true that turning something into a poem doesn't necessarily make it any more true, any more deep, any more wise 
or of any more merit in a literary or social sense. Though a neat turn of phrase can certainly make it more memorable. As a wonderful example, if you go onto Amazon, there is a book available of the poetry of Donald Trump, where someone has taken some of his rather rambling speeches and put them into, into verse form, word for word, and it's, it's entertaining. Now, for many students, a better view of what poetry might be can come from looking at work by someone more like the hip-hop artist Akala and unpacking the idea of what poetry is, how it's similar to or different from speech. I mean, after all, rap, hip-hop and other related genres involve many, most or even all of the same trends as poetry, based on our definitions above, and they're part of the lived experience and the life experience of almost all of our students. Just be careful as ever to check that any lyrics shared don't include any swearing or references that aren't age appropriate. And there's an example on the screen you'll see from Akala to demonstrate the sort of thing we're talking about. So comparing poems. Now as an example of all of what we've been talking about so far, we're going to compare a couple of poems. The first on the screen, The Red Wheelbarrow, is by one of my favourite poets, uh, William Carlos Williams, and is called The Red Wheelbarrow. Now, those of you with English literature degrees will probably already know it. It's quite famous, and it's a gift in terms of encouraging students to think about what poetry is, as is William's other um, famous poem, which is uh, This Is Just To Say. Now, I won't read it to you, but you can see it on the screen. Now, the poem is apparently very simple. Uh, wheelbarrow, rain, chickens. And it's important, presumably, because, you know, wheelbarrows are useful for farming and, and chickens are often on a farm and you know it's rained on the wheelbarrow and and the chickens now obviously williams is experimenting a bit he's playing around with the language which you can absolutely do in particularly modern poetry there's no punctuation there's erratic or unusual lineation the writing is self-consciously simple he's doing it to make a point however williams allows us to push it much further than that in terms of our interpretation we don't know why so much depends. And he clearly wants us to engage with that question. We could view it as nature, the rain, showing its power and endurance over human achievement, splitting the wheel and the barrow, the rain and the water. Equally, it can be about transference. In a complex world, the simplicity of things can become of disproportionate importance to people. Looking out of the window at that moment, fragmented in ourselves, the wheelbarrow becomes the most important thing there is, glistening in the rain. Perhaps it's even about the importance of taking time, taking a moment to think, to reflect, with a lack of punctuation and broken lines, giving it a, a meditative, reflective sort of feeling. I don't know, the, the, the poetic equivalent of, of, of Cage's composition, four minutes, 33 seconds, the idea of a pause. Perhaps it's about the comparative importance of the poem, minor, with the wheelbarrow, potentially hugely significant to someone. Now, in terms of an origin story, the story goes that Williams, who was a doctor as well as a poet, wrote this poem after spending a night treating a girl who was near death. The wheelbarrow was her toy, and as he sat by her bedside, deeply concerned by her and for her, he looked out of the window and saw this toy, her wheelbarrow. There's another anecdote also linked to the origin of the poem, which was that Williams was visiting an old friend in his area, a fisherman, someone he, he cared about deeply, and he saw the scene, more or less as described, in the man's backyard. And those two things conflated to bring this poem together. So it represents then the importance of the moment, of the experience of the person. And in neither case do we need any of that context to engage with a poem, but it can offer an angle on it. So much depends, perhaps, because the poem is just a single open sentence, unending and apparently incomplete, because life's like that, ongoing and fragmented into words and moments. In this sense, the form of the poem is the message as much as the object. Equally, maybe after all that, we just come back to the simplicity of the message. Sometimes things are necessary and important just because they are. The wheelbarrow is important because it's a wheelbarrow. Ditto the chickens. It's a good example of how and why poetry can and should work. Digging under the surface to find deeper layers of meaning. If you'll excuse the unintended farming image there. By the way, if you Google the poem, you'll find endless amounts of speculation and discussion as to the interpretation, and it's a useful tip in a more general sense. Almost any poem you come across will have sparked debate at some point, and it's worth engaging with other English staff and doing a bit of Google research in advance. Now, in contrast, 
Let's take a poem written by a Hollywood actress who shall for now remain unnamed. My heart is a wiffle ball, stroke freedom pole. And again, you can see it on the screen. Now, again, I won't do the injustice and that patronising thing of reading it to you, but you can see it. Now, clearly the actress in question knows what she's talking about. I say clearly, I assume she knows what she's talking about, because it's, it, it's hard to tell. The poem doesn't come across as deep and profound, so much as a bit clumsy and willfully obscure. And that's before we even start to think about the weird vocabulary choices, at least one of which she's, she's pretty much made up, which is kismetly as an adverb rather than as the noun kismet. The strange grammar, this completely jumbled metaphor, this confused reference frames, there's a disjointed through line to the whole thing, and, and so on. Now, for me, these two poems demonstrate something fundamental about how poetry works. As with The Red Wheelbarrow, it's a communicative treasure hunt where exploration and consideration reap rewards and benefits and understanding, where, where we can understand the surface and then drill down further into the depths. It isn't, as with My Heart is a Wiffle Ball, just willfully weird, obscure, confusing, and an attempt by someone to show how clever they are without really understanding the medium in which they're working. Now to turn back to that definition of painting with words, sometimes painters can take the raw ingredients and produce a Sistine Chapel ceiling. Others can take the same ingredients and produce something you have to turn sideways and sniff to work out whether it's a picture of their dog or something left by the dog. Now let's talk about form. And we'll pick up a few things, a few useful things, hopefully, about that comparison relating to the issue of, of form. Now, for those of you who aren't specialists, form is a word that links very closely to the idea of genre and also to structure. It basically means what kind of poem something is. If we look at traditional poems, such as the one you'll see on the screen by, by Byron, you'll spot the traditional idea of what a poem should look like. It rhymes, night, bright, light, skies, eyes, denies. It's in stanzas that are the same length, six lines in this, in this uh, instance, and the lines are the same length. They're all eight syllables or thereabouts. It's a beautiful poem, it's worth reading. Now for poets such as these, such as Byron, part of the skill was seen to be able to make the content and the phrasing fit the form, to work within and to bounce constructively off the restrictions of the medium. Caroline Duffy has talked about using a regular stanza form as being like giving margins or a picture frame, conditions to work within that help to discipline, help to clarify, and it's an idea that Stephen Fry elaborates very, very well in his book The Ove Less Travelled, which is a superb introduction to poetry. It's also true that if you look at playwrights from Shakespeare's time, the drama they're writing follows many of the same conventions, lines of regular lengths, usually ten syllables in those cases, often with rhyming built in. Now, obviously, we call this kind of writing verse. When it rhymes, as with Byron's poem there, it's called rhyming verse. When it doesn't rhyme and simply carries on continuously, as with Shakespeare's writing, it's called blank verse. And more of that when we talk about Shakespeare in, in that session. The alternative, as we've already seen in the wheelbarrow poem above and in the other one, is to have a poem that resists any kind of regular rhyme scheme or pattern to the line lengths. Free verse. And that's very popular, or has been very popular, for much of the 20th century. Although no shortage of modern poets still use rhyming verse occasionally, or often, depending on, on the subject with which they're engaging. It's become part of the toolbox. Now, as many of you will know, there's a name for stanzas depending on how many lines they've got. But the most common ones you'll come across are the couplet, two lines, known as a rhyming couplet if the two lines rhyme, and the quatrain, four lines. Some stanzas give a very, very clear nod to a particular kind of poem. So if there's a single big stanza, it's potentially a dramatic monologue, which is a poem delivered in a character's voice. And if there's a single 14 line stanza, it's probably a sonnet, which is a kind of love poem. The key thing, if talking about whether something is verse, rhyming verse, blank verse or free verse, is the impact that it has. It's a choice. And it's all about the effect. And remember, it's not necessarily about what the poet intended, although that can be useful. It's about what the reader thinks. It's about what the effect is on them. Now, to pick up on some points from earlier, the other key source of anxiety and uncertainty in reading poems for many people, and particularly for students, 
relates to the unfamiliarity and the perceived analytical complexity of them. Firstly, that they perceive students see them as being something outside their everyday lives. And secondly, the idea that analysing poetry involves more or less every analytical skill and technique used in any other kind of writing. Now, certainly in the latter case, there is something to that. But it's also an opportunity more than it is a barrier. After all, that means that more or less all the ideas, features, technical analysis and so on that they've done can be brought to bear on a poem. Now, with that in mind, let's approach a poem and work through it bit by bit. Now, the poem we're going to use for this is number nine from Alden's Twelve Songs, better known as Funeral Blues. And if you've ever seen the film Four Weddings and a Funeral, you'll know it only too well. I won't read it out to you, but if you nip onto YouTube, you'll be able to find the excellent John Hanna performing it beautifully. Now the first thing to point out with any poem we're trying to help students access is that it is, despite the views of writers such as you know Shelley and Wordsworth, a poem is simply a text on a page and we need to get a handle on what it's about, who it's about, what happens and, and so on. Now titles are useful and a straightforward starting point after all, they're logical labels that a poet sticks on their work. In this case, the funeral reference is clear enough, with the blues linking the musical expression of negativity with the idea of being sad, of being blue. It's also listed, the poem is, as being called Stop All the Clocks. And a useful line of discussion with students might be to compare the impact of those two titles. Now, in terms of what the poem is about, there are various ways of getting students to grips with the narrative, with the structure and with the subject. A simple idea is to give the students simply the first and the last lines of the poem and see what they can infer from the journey between the two. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, down to, for nothing now can ever come to any good. And for a poem such as this, such as Funeral Blues, students would probably be able to infer quite a lot. The sense of rejecting sound and therefore society, of the almost nihilistic hopelessness that the narrator feels. Another useful idea is to get away from the idea of it being a poem, to put the poem into prose. And if we do this, the end result will look something like number three, as you can see on the screen. Now, what this allows students to do is to see each stanza, each section, as the equivalent of a paragraph, without, at least initially, being distracted by things such as rhyme, lineation, and, and, and so on. And each paragraph, of course, has its own focus. So labelling each one can be a useful way of seeing how it all links together. Here, we start by dismissing all the sounds, ensuring silence before the funeral procession begins. Then we step back and we hear about the, the wider impact that the narrative voice wants to see in the world and, and so on. It builds, it links, it escalates. Now I've seen lessons where teachers simply distribute the stanzas randomly without sharing the order and students have to work out a logical sequence for them to fit into. It's an idea. In terms of the subject, again, all we're seeing is more or less what was predictable from the title. It's a personal voice recounting an individual's emotions about the loss of a loved one. So what? We've got a pretty good handle on, including what happens. What about who? Well, one of the first things we want to be spotting, as with any text, is the perspective from which the text is presented, the voice. Here is very much a first person account, my though linked to the observational perspective of the funeral itself, and also some descriptive details of a third person, he, in terms of the loved one. Now clearly, the voice is of someone who loved the lost man, for whom the lost loved one was their everything. And we can fairly safely assume that that means they were romantically involved with them. And yes, the noun love in the third stanza drops a big hint there. Now, as we know, poetry can often seem very personal, which is why students almost always leap to the idea of them being autobiographical, and most of the time they'd be right. However, we need to be very careful when teaching it, because this isn't something we can necessarily assume. When Robert Browning writes a series of poems from the point of view of a, of a murdering duke or a homicidal lover, it would be ridiculous to assume he's writing from his own experience. Agatha Christie, after all, wasn't the most prolific serial killer the world has ever known. In the case of this poem, Auden, the poet, originally wrote this poem as a satirical piece, not a sincere account, though he did turn it into a more serious poem a few years later. Auden was gay, which people often read into the references to he, but it wasn't autobiographical, so this isn't necessarily relevant. Context is one of those strange beasts where it can enrich and deepen our understanding, but it won't necessarily. 
and discretion and judgment are needed in dealing with it, along with clear and thorough research. Well, let's try looking at the poem laid out as the writer intended. What you'll immediately spot is the regular stanzas, and without even counting syllables and the lines, you can see that they're roughly the same length. Each stanza, four lines long, is known as a quatrain, and they are regular. The lines, if you counted syllables, you'd find would vary between about nine and twelve syllables, which is relatively standard for poetry written in English. You'd also spot the rhyme scheme, with each pair of lines rhyming, and each stanza made up of two sets of rhyming lines. Now, for any non-specialists, we always begin with the first rhyme represented by the letter A, with any other line ending in the same rhyme also taking an A, and then B for the next rhyme, and so on. Here, the first stanza would be AABB, although you'd find some students arguing the case on that one, because it does depend a little bit on your pronunciation of phone and bone. For students in parts of Teesside, for example, it would be a phone and a bone, which wouldn't be a full rhyme. Now, because spotting this kind of rhyming is easy, logical, it's mathematical, students often latch on to it quite comfortably with minimal difficulty. What's more of a challenge is helping them to think of the effect of it. With a slightly irregular line lengths, we could easily argue that the narrator is attempting to control their emotions, but struggling. With the couplets, we could easily argue that the poem is structured around pairings, two rhyming lines, two couplets in each stanza, and so on. Now again, this sort of thing can be useful, but it isn't always. Discretion is needed, and there isn't always a right answer, so much as there might be interesting answers. As with any discussion of the structure of something, there are a set of aspects, key aspects, that we can look for. Is it narrative? Is it chronological? What's the focus of each stanza? Where does it begin? Where does it arrive at in terms of the end of the poem? Now, none of these, apart from the word stanza, is specific to poetry. It can all be relevant. Now, we talked in other sessions about the idea of semantic fields, and these can also be an interesting feature to look for in terms of working through structure in poetry. Now, if, for example, we were to group the keywords from each stanza for this poem, and we're probably talking about the nouns there, it would end up looking something like what you see on the screen. Clock, telephone, dog bone, pianos, drum, coffin, mourners, aeroplane, sky, message, bows, next doves, policeman, gloves, and so on. Now, this is an easy way to help students spot patterns, lexical threads, semantic fields, ideas, and so on. Here, for example, the focus on sound and noise in that first stanza, on uh, scope and distance and measurement in the third stanza, and so on. Now, the same can work with the verbs. So we would get, for example, stop, cut, prevent, barking, silence, bring and let, let, circle, moaning, scribbling, put, let, wear, and, and, and so on. It's even possible to lay the poem out on the page with only the nouns and or the verbs showing, blanking in terms of colouring the font of the words in between so that they blend into the background. It's a technique that Jeff Barton has used when teaching poetry, and I do call it Bartoning the poem. That way we get to engage with the words and with the structure simultaneously. Looking at the sentences can also be useful, for example, colour coding the sentences in the poem and then asking students, without even reading the words, what impression they get. Where the poem moves quickly, where it moves slowly, where there are sudden shifts and changes and so on. And you can see that on the right hand side of the screen. Now, again, this isn't always useful, but it can be. Here, the segmentation of the poem into those regular sentences would certainly be worth discussing. There was a final couple of things that can be worth considering with students when discussing poetry. It can be interesting to look at aspects such as the lineation, caesuras, and enjambois. Now, as you'll know, these are simply in the case of lineation, uh, how lines are laid out, where they begin and where they end. In terms of caesura, where there are breaks or pauses inside the line, where it cuts them. And for enjambois, where sentences in lines overflow onto subsequent lines. Now, all of these can be relevant. Uh, if we look at the caesuras in the third stanza of the poem, for example, they create a sense of fragmentation, of separation, particularly the, uh, the abrupt one created by the colon in the fourth line. The enjambement in the, the first stanza, where the third line flows onto the fourth, 
suggests the continuity of the funeral procession. Now again, these aren't always useful or relevant, but they can be. One idea that often comes up is to reframe the content of the poem, to take what we're given and to reshape it into a different genre. It's an interesting idea, and it does lend itself to thinking about why a poem is an effective medium for this topic. After all, poets often write novels or scripts and so on. So why a poem? However, it's important when we do this not to deviate too far. Asking a student to write, say, an obituary might be an interesting exercise in a general sense, but it may not also necessarily add much to their engagement with funeral blues as a poem, and it could lead to placing students in situations where we and they are dealing with some very, very deeply personal topics. That can be useful, a way of achieving catharsis, some kind of release. But it should always, always be done with eyes wide open and as, as fully informed about student contexts as it's possible to be. Now, a very interesting idea I have seen work well is to take the key vocabulary, the key images, the key sounds, and create a mood board or a montage that then acts as a prompt for a piece of descriptive writing. You know, the interleaving and interweaving of genres and skills helps to clarify and to usefully contrast them. And you can see an example of that at the top right hand side of the screen there. What about sounds? Now, quite often students will pick up on sound features when we read a poem. And that's a good reason to ensure that a, a poem is read out loud. For some poets, Wordsworth, I think, being a prime example, and Owen Shears, a more recent one, Perfecting the rhythm of a poem can mean stomping up and down a path for hours on end, trying to get it to fit. Where there is a rhythm, it can be worth picking up on why. For Auden, the rhythm really kicks in for that third stanza, where the string of references seems to sweep us along on the emotions, this outpouring of grief. It's also common to spot features such as alliteration, sibilance, onomatopoeia, and so on. Uh, as we read through a poem. For example, here we see the alliterating of the C on clocks and the C on cut, clocks and cut in that first line, with the abrupt, aggressive sound helping to reinforce the single syllable words and the sense of cruelty, of negativity. Students quite often, you'll find, focus more on letters than sounds, trying to argue that T and th alliterate because the letter's the same. But it's the sound that matters. And we're back to the importance of reading and or hearing the poem out loud. And even more than that, it's the effect of the sound that matters. The same is true of when onomatopoeias occur. Bark or moan in funeral blues, for example. And that's a key issue for a lot of the sound features that the, that the students pick up on. What these features do. For some poems, it's easy. So when Wilfred Owen writes about the merciless iced east winds that nive us. The sibilance clearly reflects the slightly sinister atmosphere and the wind and the whispering and so on. The problem is that poems that students read will often lead them to leap to the feature and then struggling for anything to say, they'll try to duck the issue by saying that it's to have an effect on the reader or to build tension. You know, those phrases that we English teachers and examiners learn to loathe. Now, these sorts of comments are almost always facile nonsense. They're a waste of time. That said, there are some poets such as, yes, Wilfred Owen, Ted Hughes, Seamus Heaney, Owen Shears, Imtiat Starker, Margaret Atwood. Poets such as those where the use of sounds builds up to become a kind of soundscape. And when they do, it is absolutely, definitely worth discussing. Now, one useful idea for linking sounds to effects is to couple sounds with any images that they're part of. And nine times out of ten, you'll find sound features are intended to reinforce, to convey, or to add tonally to a metaphor or a simile that's been provided. Now, imagery, as any English specialist knows, is one of those safe things that occurs in almost any text that we study, whether that's fiction, non-fiction, prose, poetry, drama, we can't always guarantee there'll be a metaphor or a simile or a personification, but it's a safe bet there'll be at least one of them somewhere in the text. Now, similes are generally easier to spot thanks to the structure, like or as, as students often try to define it. Metaphors are trickier, since almost anything referenced in a poem can be symbolic, it can be metaphorical. As with sounds, of course, 
It's the effect that's the important bit. Now, in lessons on poetry, it's common to give students the names of features and ask them to define them or to give students features and ask them for examples. In better lessons, it's common to give students features and ask them for examples and the effects that they have. But an interesting approach is to flip that, to give students effects that the poet might want and then to suggest ways they might try and achieve it and then to look for those features in the poem. For example, um, Auden wants to make his narrator sound like they're broken up by grief. So we might expect, therefore, to find a lot of cesiris, some uh, limited amount of enchantment, some harsh sounds alliterated, semantic feelings of, say, grief, darkness, that sort of thing. And even having seen only the title, students could predict those and then find proof either that they're correct or that they're incorrect. And both are useful and can prompt some interesting discussion. It also helps students to think from the perspective of the writer and, as eventually, the writer of their own pieces of descriptive, narrative or persuasive writing. Following the process is also useful, getting students to select a topic, a tone, and then to plan and construct the piece. Now with imagery, obviously as teachers we run into that classic problem of the curtains of blue in the sense of going deeper than the poet intended or assuming depth where there isn't any. However, Items that are focused on in poetry are, because of the, the honed and polished approach that it involves, they're very, very likely to be symbolic, to stand for something. In funeral blues, for example, the clocks might just be stopping because they're noisy. He wants silence for the funeral. However, clocks also symbolise time. He wants time to stop, perhaps. He wants to cut off the telephone. It's another noisy thing. However, it's also a means of communication, something that connects him to the outside world and to other people. And that's also something he wants to abandon, to refuse, perhaps. It's worth being a little bit careful, though. We could, for example, interpret doves based on its Germanic root, which refers to the bird's diving flight. It's the descent of the narrator's grief. It's echoing the descent of the moaning aeroplane. In the ancient Mesopotamian culture, doves were religious symbols associated with love and sexuality, which links to the grief and loss of the loved one in the poem. Uh, the Greeks also associated doves with Aphrodite, the love goddess, sacrificed in her honour at festivals, doves were, perhaps suggesting that the narrator has abandoned traditional Christian beliefs in favour of paganism in their grief, that their loved one is a sacrifice, and so on. Now, all of those probably are a step too far for most people. The most external context and the more external sort of context that we have and that we bring to an interpretation, the more that we need in order to justify what we're saying, the further away from the actual poem uh, it actually gets, the more tenuous, the less helpful. That said, if there's an individual association for an individual reader, it's valid. It could still be an addition in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a holistic sense. Now, useful ways of engaging with imagery could, for example, involve giving students visual prompts for the images in the poem and asking them for associations with them. What can they mean? What vocabulary can they build around them? What inferences can they draw? And so on. Just watch out for separation of reference frames. What we as teachers might recognise as something biblical, many students would either not recognise or associate with something completely different. I mean, show a teacher an, an apple, for example, and we think of the judgment of Paris in Greek mythology or uh, the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Many students don't have those reference frames to hand. For them, it may simply be a fruit, something they were forced to eat at primary school, something that grows on a tree. As with any text, when we boil things down to basics, a lot of what we do with any text, and poetry included, is to work with words. Now, as you'll know, if you've looked at any of the other um, sessions in the English programme or delivered any lessons from any of the 2020 curriculum schemes, there's a lot of focus on concepts and vocabulary. There's various reasons for that, but one of the simplest and the most useful here is the way that it allows us to access some of the more nuanced ideas and vocabulary that accompanies them. A student who has, for example, looked at the themes of love in A Midsummer Night's Dream in Year 7, who's looked at, say, love and jealousy in Year 8, the idea of isolation in Oliver Twist and grief in poems in the anthologies across Year 7 to 9. That student already has a stock of ideas and interpretive points and a range of vocabulary to do with those concepts. So a key teaching point 
is to aid students in transferring that learning across, linking, applying, reinforcing everything. That way, when a student is presented with a topic or a text that they don't know, they can very quickly bring a bundle of useful stuff to it. It's an equipped start, not a blank one. Now, in terms of working with vocabulary in poetry, there are a few useful things that we can do here. With the sometimes heightened style of many poems, we do sometimes find vocabulary that is less familiar for students. And running through those routines of deconstructing and contextualising words can be useful. I mean, if we took the word dismantle, for example, in the phrase dismantle the sun here, there are a few steps we can take. Firstly, identify the word class. Here it's a verb. It's something that someone is doing. OK, we can then dismantle the word. We've got mantle, which students might link to clothing, to a fireplace or, if they're geographically minded, to the layers of the Earth's interior. OK, layers are covering something. We've got dis, which can mean separate or can reverse the meaning of whatever comes next. We can then look at it in the phrase to do something the opposite in relation to the sun. We can look at it in the verse. Well, we're packing up the moon, we're pouring away the ocean, we're sweeping up the wood. Clearly, dismantle refers to getting rid of the sun. We may not arrive at the perfect definition, but notice that if we follow those stages, we'd probably end up somewhere pretty darn close. Now, in terms of trying to unpack the meaning of individual words here, it can also be useful to consider the alternatives, to consider synonyms. Auden chose dismantle. But he could have chosen disassemble, undo, break, destroy, deconstruct, disband, disperse, tear down, demolish. So why dismantle? It might be to do with the syllable count, the rhythm, the connotations of the word, how strongly the word expresses the idea, and, and so on. Now beyond this, of course, we shift into looking at the idea of semantic fields, of layering up the meaning and the interpretation once again. And having worked through the various layers of the poem, we are in a position to step back and see the broader picture, the ideas, the concepts, the themes. Now, clarity of definition is crucial here. It's an unusual year for me not to have students confused about the differences between, say, imagery and themes, especially since imagery usually provides some of the strongest signposts towards thematic understanding. Emphasising imagery as linked to sensory and symbolic experience is useful, uh, themes and concepts being non-sensory or mental. We are more or less using concept and theme interchangeably at this point, based on the idea that concepts are ideas, themes, issues, explored throughout the curriculum, uh, acting as thematic threads. As previously, it's worth checking back through the list of key themes that we explore throughout our curriculum. Uh, we've got power and control, conflict, relationships, as you can see, society, causality, identity, appearance and reality. Now, the overwhelming likelihood is that the key themes in almost any text would link back to those key seven. And that allows students to transfer more nuanced ideas, prior discussions, thoughts and importantly, vocabulary across. Those seven are interlinked and they do flow from one to another. It's important, obviously, to ensure that students understand the difference between the superficial focus of the text, what it's literally about, and the ideas that the writer is exploring and attempting to convey, what it's, what it's actually about. In the case of Funeral Blues, obviously it's literally about the death of a loved one and their funeral, but Auden is also exploring the linked themes of grief, of abandonment, of anger, the lived experience of the individual. I'd suggest that uh, from that list of, of ideas, that power and control is a natural link. Relationships is also useful. Others may be. Now, when we're discussing themes, clearly it's crucial to build up to them. How are themes presented? Through the voice, through the form, through the imagery, through the vocabulary. All of those other factors ultimately lead to a discussion of themes, of concepts. Now, a useful teaching idea here is to offer provocations, as I've called them. Statements that are partially, mostly true or untrue, that can stimulate a debate either supportively or negatively. Basically, statements that are going to get a reaction from a student. 
For example, we could offer students the idea that the narrator of Funeral Blues seems to have lost all sense of proportion in their grief, that they have lost control of their ideas and their emotions, that they appear more concerned with their own feelings than with the person who's died. We could offer them the idea that the narrator seems more angry than grieving. Now, each of these can be discussed and debated with evidence found and so on. Now, for those of you who know the English language GCSE papers, it's also useful in terms of building an evaluative response. So how do we go about comparing poems? After all, this is an essential skill involved in both the anthology and the unseen poetry at GCSE. Now, clearly the first point to make is that poems can be compared on a number of different levels. The most obvious first level is to compare the poems based on their content, obviously. So, for example, we might compare Hawk Roosting and Out of the Blue from the Year 7 Poetry Anthology, based on them both being about individuals physically high up. In both cases, that higher perspective is relevant to their view of the world. The Hawk, arrogant and egocentric. Armitage as narrator, isolated and reflective. On a deeper level, we might choose to compare poems based on their themes, the key concepts. From the Year 8 anthology, we might then look at the poems Flag and Dulce et Decorum Est in terms of their treatment of the emptiness of, uh, sorry, the emptiness of, of, of patriotism. For Agard, it's an emptiness born of a lack of individual identity or submission to an apparently higher power or authority, however arbitrary that may be. For Owen, it's born of a, a visceral, brutal, physical, individual confrontation with the impact of that kind of mindless patriotism. We could alternatively compare or contrast poems based on their contexts. So looking at, in the Year 9 anthology, for example, both Simon Armitage's The Not Dead and Caroline Duffy's The Last Post, in terms of non-combatants born after the war trying to look back on events and contrasted in terms of context with Wilfred Owen's poems written by a serving soldier. Now both Armitage and Duffy view events through the lens of history, the idea of how the present is built on the past and flows from those events. For Owen, there's almost always a sense of the moment and how it's situated within that wider context of that moment. It's immediate and it's reflective, but without the wider situating within the flow of history. Now beyond this, we could of course compare poems based on their form. And again, um, from the Year 9 anthology, both Wordsworth and Browning use extended single stanzas to deliver a monologue or an extended autobiographical musing um, on the part of Wordsworth. That's a similarity. Um, in terms of the impact, in terms of their individual voice offering their worldview. There's an extended sense of their values and their views. However, while Browning intends that to have a distancing effect, to force us to question the assumptions and actions of his narrator and thus society in a more general sense, Wordsworth here intends for his reader to recognise the profundity of his experiences, to acknowledge his fitness to construct and convey the great romantic ideal, similar form, very different impacts. And then, of course, there are stylistic differences and similarities that we could unpack. Again, from the Year 7 anthology, Wordsworth uses sibilance to convey the calmness of the morning, where the city is bright and glittering in the smokeless air, where never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour. Whereas Blake, similarly using sibilance in a poison tree in the line sunned it with my smiles and with soft deceitful wiles, creates a sinister tone. Alternatively, both Wilfred Owen and Mtiat's Dark in the Year 7 anthology use the word the boy as a figure symbolically um, to represent the future, the impact of the actions of the present, with that word conveying a sense of innocence, of potential, and so on. Now, the best comparisons obviously work on all those levels, and differences can be as interesting as similarities. Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, for example, offers a wildly different tone and central message to Hugh's poem, Bayonet Charge, although both use a sense of a driving rhythm of physical impetus to add to their effect. 
The common narrative thread of the charge, however, makes for a far more interesting contrast in terms of the individual focus of Hughes's poem and the group identity of Tennyson's. The willingness to die in Tennyson's poem versus the overwhelming fear of Hughes's poem, the patriotic self-awareness of the cavalry versus the survival instinct of the individual infantryman. Now, there'll be more on comparisons in a later session, but hopefully um, that's a useful starting overview. And that's more or less it for this session. Now, hopefully there have been some useful ideas and points in terms of engaging with poetry. From a personal perspective, I do think poetry is a useful genre to explore with students. From a creative perspective, distilling ideas, honing them, framing them, polishing them. I mean, that can be a really useful exercise in understanding the writer's craft. They can also be a useful means of dealing with challenging ideas or emotions. I mean, there's a reason that many of the outlets used in therapy require a conscious construction and offer an openness of interpretation, art, music, drama and dance. If we do have students dealing with some difficult things in their lives, it can be a very useful outlet for them, using other perspectives and voices to ventriloquise their experiences, to shape their emotions, and then to construct the means of expressing themselves. Poetry is also useful because it brings all of the various literary skills into play. It's an excellent training ground for analysing more or less anything else. Now, if you are looking for further reading on poetry as a medium, I would very strongly recommend uh, Michael Rosen's What is Poetry, Stephen Fry's The Ode Less Travelled, and Ted Hughes' uh, Poetry in the Making. All three are, are excellent. Right, many thanks for your time today. Do discuss any questions, queries, comments or concerns with your head of department or with your director of subject, and stay safe and stay well. Goodbye.